And my wife has been so incredibly strong and was always able to send me off with encouraging words, no matter how hard it was. Um, it was more difficult with my kids. They didn't really understand what was going on. Um, my youngest son, Yaakov, um, at first, we had gotten out for, for about 24 hours. We were supposed to go back, you know, on Friday morning. Um, and at that point, he was not he was not ready to say goodbye to me. Anytime I went near the door, he would break down hysterically crying. No, Abba, don't go. I'm getting my shoes. I come with you. I, don't go. And like, I wasn't even leaving. I was just went near the door and it was tearing my heart out. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. And since October 7th, everyone's been wondering what in the world is going on in Israel? What exactly is going on in Gaza? And that's exactly why we are speaking to two incredible soldiers that uh, just recently were in Gaza. One of them is actually going back in a few hours and hearing their background and also seeing the Yad Hashem, seeing the hand of God in Gaza, as well as the painful moments that we can't ignore and what is giving them strength. This episode is a memory of Shevin David Ben Yaakov Shlema, as well as Miriam Sarah Bas Yaakov Moshe. And stick around at the end for a very special message. You'll also hear in this episode, the go-to place when it comes to technology and software and everything tech, Bitbean. You'll hear about my favorite clothing brand, Twillery, and how you could get an awesome discount. You'll hear about if you have a company and you need to staff it with incredible people hiring for less and why to go to them and use them. You'll also hear about an incredible book called Growth Through Darkness that is all about going through challenges. And here is my conversation with Noam and Shlomo. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Thank you, Noam White and Shlomo Raymond, for taking time out of your extremely busy schedules. Uh, I know, Shlomo, you're going back into Gaza Tomorrow, in yeah. less than 24 hours from now. Thank you for having yeah, us. Okay, so I would love to, I would love to hear a little background about each of you, and then your experience on October 7th, and then right after that, I want to get right into it, what you actually saw in Gaza and are seeing in Gaza. Um, my name is Noam White, originally born and raised in New Rochelle, New York. I made Aliyah in 2010 after my Shana Aleph. I've uh, been here ever since. I drafted into the army in 2012 into a special forces unit, which specializes in explosives, served as a, as a sniper, and I've been serving in Miluim in reserves with the same group that I trained with um, for the past, since then. It's almost 13, year, 13 years we've been together now. Um, so on October 7th, uh, my family and I, my wife and our three kids, we were by our in-laws, my in-laws, in Efrat. And uh, we were in, I was in Shul, and at about 8.15 in the morning, the Kitat Konanut, the emergency readiness team of the community, came in and made an announcement that there's some kind of terrorist activity going on in the south, and there are lots of rockets being fired to make, and then that we should go home and make sure that our families are aware and that they're near the bomb shelter. So I walk home, a little bit, you know, worried, not quite sure what's going on, and get home in make sure everybody knows my wife is still sleeping with my daughter. Um, and so I decided not to wake them up because you never know, like Efrat is not really in the, the normal areas that, that they shoot rockets to. And about nine o'clock or so, uh, we, get a, we get a siren and I go upstairs to, to wake her up, carry my, my daughter downstairs. They're, you know, bewildered, not, not sure what's going on. And we go down to the, to the bomb shelter. Um, before I close the door, at that point, I was more worried of, about what's going on. So I go to get my phone because I'm an active service of uh, the reserves. And um, if something that big was going on that they're making an announcement in Shul, I should probably have my phone on me. And I um, turn on my phone at that point and start Coming the the WhatsApps from our commander start coming in to to be ready to uh, come down to base if they need. Um, and after a couple of sirens and a couple of like getting some more information that's trickling in, and we're realizing how big this event is, this uh, this terrorist attack was. They told me to go home and get my equipment together and be ready to be called down to to the south. Um, so at about eleven o'clock, eleven fifteen, I take our car from Efrat drive from there to the community that we live in. It's called Neria, it's near Modin. And along the way, I see tons and tons of people in their, in their reserves uniforms um, driving. 
and uh, it's really starting to hit how how big this event must must be. And I even passed by on the the 443, one of the one of the highways leading from Yerushalayim to to Modi'in. Passed by a reserves base, and I see cars backed up for about two kilometers on each side of the road, and reservists are pouring into this base. And I was I was shocked. Uh, one just how fast people were responding. And there was a little bit of, of pride in, to, to see that, but also, you know, the shock of the, how big and terrible this must be if so many people were already being called, called to their bases. And at that point, I get, I get home, um, prepare my equipment, and uh, wait for the call to, be, to go down south because we understood that the roads weren't safe. We couldn't necessarily just go directly to base. And only at about 11 o'clock at night, um, on Motzei Shabbat, did we get the official call to go down to base, and so all of us went. Everyone in my unit uh, made it back, made it down to base um, as fast as I could. Okay, and we'll we'll get more into uh, what happens after that. But Shlomo, tell us um, where you're from and uh, what your experience was on October seventh. So I was born in Teaneck, New Jersey. Actually, um, when I was fourteen, my whole family moved to Israel to Beit Shemesh. So high school, I was, I was in Israel, and I went to Hezder Yeshiva, uh, which is a program where you combine yeshiva studying with the army. And I was in combat engineering um, a year and four months, and then since then reserve d- duty. And October 7th, very similar to uh, Noam's experience. You know, you hear the sirens, you check your phone, your commander tells you, we're not sure if we're being called up. Motzei Shabbos, okay, tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., everyone's at base. You drive down, you see all the cars parked on the side of the road, and you're just like, what is going on? You hear the terrible news. Um, I personally decided not to read news after like a couple of hours, because I said, I have a mission now, potentially, and I need to be focused on that, and I can't be looking at the news. I'd go crazy. And so I still haven't you know, really uh, dealt with everything that happened on October 7th. Um, and I've been, you know, been working ever since. So could you just take us into it? What is it actually like being in Gaza? Is it scarier than I'm anticipating? Is it easier than I'm anticipating? Could you paint a picture of what it's like? Um, I could definitely try. Um, some things you need to, uh, hopefully you don't have to experience. Um, it definitely changes. Um, at the beginning, it's very, very scary for me personally. Um, but then you get used to it. You know, after a couple of days, Nothing happens, nothing too crazy happens, and you're just, okay, this is just like a training exercise, just it happens to be real. You even start calling your missy moat, your missions, you call them, uh, you call them training exercises by accident. (laughs) You know, you get into, you get, you get used to it. We're, you know, amazing at adapting. And then if anything happens, you kind of get like, oh, wait, I'm, I'm in Gaza. It's a little bit going back in the time machine to back to army days. I was discussing with a friend how, you know, for us, It's not like we're actively missing our regular life. There's nothing to remind me of of my wife. She's not supposed to be in Gaza, you know? Um, So I'm just back with my friends from Yeshiva, back with my friends from the army, and we're concentrating on our mission. We're distracted. I think the experience of, like, my family back home is much harder. They're in regular life, and then, oh, where's where's my husband? Where's Shlomo? He's not here. Where's my partner? You know, and they're... um, So I think they're the real heroes, and that's an experience definitely worth uh, checking out. Um, and they're always on the news. They're like they he- hearing all the bad news. news. We don't yeah. we don't have our phones. We don't we don't we're disconnected from everything. We don't know what's going on other than what's right near you. Though being disconnected from phones is is definitely an experience. Um, probably more jaunting than Gaza. If it's not having your phone on you for two weeks, um, people people can't handle it. Um, but then there's also things you never expected. You know, you're sleeping on a random mattress that you found. Um, suddenly you find yourself doing things you've never done before. Um, no, I mean, how about you? What, what has your experience in Gaza been like? Um, I guess pretty, pretty similar. Um, there are certain aspects which were scarier than I expected and certain aspects which were much more chill, and much more, you know, of a lighthearted um, experience than, than I would have expected. I guess like, you know, when we first walked into Gaza, my unit, we didn't have any, uh, armored personnel carriers or APCs. 
Um, so we walked in with all of our gear on our back. Uh, you know, I had about 50 kilos, so that's like 100 plus pounds on my back. Walking in, we walked for about eight kilometers, eight, 10 kilometers in. And as you're getting closer to the border, the explosions of like the, the cover fire, artillery fire, airstrikes, uh, mortars, tanks, machine gun fire just keeps on getting louder. You couldn't go three seconds without cast hearing a massive explosion. And uh, as we're walking in, it, you smell the smoke and the sulfur. And like the, at that point, they'd been bombing for like three weeks. So like there was the, the smell of like rotting flesh. And I could really felt and looked, um, sorry for, for those who don't get this analogy, it felt like Frodo walking into Mordor, um, uh, the Lord of the Rings geek, um, walking, in, like, walking into Gehenna. And we walk in and every, it's pitch black other than the fires and the explosions. And you are, you're really, really high strung at that point. You're, you know, ready for anything for a terrorist to pop out of a, a tunnel at any point. And we started walking through a, a lemon orchard. And um, it's a very dangerous area to fight because you can't see anything. You can't see anything in front of you. And so the bulldozers had bulldozed a path through through for us to walk through, and it smelled it smelled like like lemons. The 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 smell just completely changed. It was like all all of a sudden just like whoa, such a citrusy smell. And I immediately was reminded of uh, Yosef getting sold down to to Egypt when yes. it, uh, the Torah says that um, the Yishma Elim uh, brought him uh, brought him down to Egypt. And they were carrying spices, good smelling spices. The Rashi asks, like, why does it, why does it mention the spices? And so he says, because to, to show how HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like takes care of the tzaddikim, shows his, shows his presence to the tzaddikim. And I immediately felt, okay, I'm like Yosef going down to the, 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 the trials and tribulations of Mitzrayim, but Hashem, Hashem is with us. He's, he's watching over us. We and know. that was like the first experience of like really feeling God's presence with us. And it really, that stayed with us, stayed with us the, the whole time. We, we had olive orchard, orchards, and those don't have a smell. <laughs> so I guess I'm less of a tzaddik. <laughs> uh, no, no. What can we do? Uh, but the, going in, the experience, he reminded me, we weren't supposed to go into Gaza originally. We were told the first three weeks of training that our job is to go, blow a hole in the fence so that other soldiers can go in and go back, and that's it, and we're done. Um, that plan changed, like... 10 minutes before the actual mission. They're like, actually, never mind, you guys are going in. And so a 12 hour mission turned into a 12 day mission. And that was really hard because we had no time to prepare mentally. We didn't tell our families. Oh. Um, and we had no idea how they were handling it at home. That was really, really difficult. Um, guys were saying that like when 12 days are up and we're, we're take our little break, guys were saying that they weren't coming back. Um, it was, it was very, very hard mentally. The, um, you know, the, it's scary. Um, it's something you're not expected ever to find yourself in a situation like that. You usually run away from danger, not, not into it. But everyone came back. Um, and for what it did it for me was going home that Shabbat and seeing all the families at shul when they davened, kids playing in the park, and you're reminded of, wait a second, what are we fighting for? You know, we're fighting for these families to be safe. There are people that can't go to shul all the hostages that they can't play with their family and they need us there in, in Gaza. So even though the beginning mentally was so difficult, w everyone came back for, for a second round and a third round and fourth and fifth round. And it got easier as, as you go in, like we got used to it. That's what I was talking about beforehand. Um, but going in just mentally, it's some, it's, you're, no one's ready for that. There's no way to train for that. So I know before October 7th, unfortunately, there's a lot of strife, a lot of different sects of Judaism, uh, I guess, fighting, for lack of a better term, in Israel. And since then, there's definitely been a unity. Are you guys seeing that unity in your, again, I don't know the army word for it, but in your groups, in the the the, the other people that you're with? I'm sure there's you're, you're working with people that are, are Orthodox Jews and people that are I don't know, even atheists, I, I'm not even sure. Like, could you tell us about what that vibe is like? Yeah, sure. Um, my unit, um, I didn't draft through Hezder. So the guys that I, that I served with, for the most part, 
or not religious. Um, I'd say a majority of them are probably Masorati, traditional, believe in God, but don't necessarily keep, you know, Torah and mitzvot. Um, and there are definitely, there are a couple of atheists by us, and there are a couple of really uh, from, from guys as well in my Puga. There are a couple of guys who learn in Kolel, and then there are, you know, the classic high-tech Tel Aviv scene as well. Um, none of that, none of that mattered. None of that strife mattered once we got there. Everybody was coming for the same reason, to do the same thing. And it's, it honestly is one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever experienced is that feeling of, of achtut, of like brotherhood, um, that every single person who came, religious, secular, uh, lived in the North, South, Sephardi, Ashkenazi, doesn't matter, were coming with a readiness to lay down their life for Am Yisrael, and that was the only thing that mattered. And feeling all the love and support and attention from Am Yisrael pouring into the army, right? And we're getting like pie, like just any pieces of equipment that we needed, uh, food, everything. We just felt the love and the presence of all of Am Yisrael. Uh, everything just fell away. All that strife just fell away. And uh, it's my, really my tefillah that, that we continue this afterwards because it's, it's the, the most beautiful thing I've, I've felt in my life. Noam, how, do, how does an atheist um, identify what's going on around them? Are, are they still atheists around you? So there's one guy who really like defined himself as an atheist by us. Um, a couple of guys probably define themselves as agnostic. But after a certain uh, incident, maybe I'll tell it, I'll tell it uh, later, that you know, it was a real nice that happened to us. He said, I he said, you know, I, I, I don't believe in God. I, I'm an atheist, but that was a miracle. <laughs> so I, I don't think he remained uh, an atheist. Uh, the, the, uh, there was a guy by us where something happened similar, where an RPG missed, and our commander afterwards going, called it a nace. And he's like, do you mean statistics? Like, statistic, <laughs> do you mean statistics? Right? That was his response. He was stuck with it. Um, but in general, I felt that the achdut, the um, unity, com camaraderie, yeah, camaraderie, the unity, it's a good word, um, existed in the army specifically even beforehand. That was something unique about the army is once you put on, um, once you put on this uniform, everyone looks the same. Um, and that unity almost existed in a smaller sense always in, in Sahal, um, in the IDF. And what happened here was that it expanded almost outwards. Everyone felt like they were wearing a uniform. Everyone felt part of what was going on. Um, and so leaving the army and seeing that, oh wow, also outside of the army there's this unity, that was really incredible. We'll be right back to this week's episode and the most heartwarming moment didn't even happen yet. But first, I have two very special messages for you today. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitbean, a company that's like the Silicon Valley of the Jewish community. And they're not just any software company, they're they're a beacon of innovation and expertise in our community. Bitbean is renowned for its team of expert designers and engineers and so many incredible staff. And they are the creme de la creme in the software world, bringing together the best minds to tackle even the most complex challenges. So if you're looking to invest in a top-notch technology, look no further. Bitbean is a class apart delivering unparalleled software solutions that are simply the best in their league. And personally, what I think makes Bitbean truly special is their deep connection with our community. They don't just speak tech, they speak your language. For years, Bitbean has been collaborating with top companies in our community, and honestly, the world, solving complex issues across all industries. They understand the unique challenges we face and offer innovative technology solutions that drive success. And their track record speaks for itself. So Bitbean has helped numerous organizations and companies like Tour Anytime, Riverside Abstract, um, Eastern Union, Chabad on Campus, Chazdi Lev, and many more. 
and they help them develop powerful and enterprise-grade solutions. These collaborations have not only solved problems, but also have propelled these organizations and companies to new heights. So if you're looking to transform your business with cutting edge technology, Bitbean is your go-to partner. Check them out at bitbean.com and see how they can help your business not just survive, but thrive in this digital age. Now, I also have to say, this is nothing I, I spoke about with them. They are awesome people. I've dealt with them for now a few weeks and I've seen firsthand how they operate. I think whenever you hire a company to help your company, you want their services to be great. But something I think people overlook is who are the people behind it? They are very intelligent and also very yashar and kind. And I think that's what makes them so successful at what they do. They're smart and they're nice. And that's something that helps grow companies when you bring on people like that to help you with any technology needs. So go ahead, software, tech, anything, anything tech related, go to them. Uh, you could see a lot more on their website. So go and check them out. Now we're going to be right back this week's episode, but first I need to tell you about how I am changing my life. Yeah, it's it's a little of a silly way, but it's working. So I've been talking about Twillery for a while now, and they wanted to send me some samples of some clothes because they noticed a pattern that I'm always getting these button down shirts and the classic stretchy pants, which are all awesome in the suits. And they're like, Yaakov, you have tried out our, our long sleeve polo. And I'm like, Hey guys at Twillery, I'm not really a long sleeve polo type of guy. I ordered it. Two things have happened. First of all, I am not a strong person. This shirt makes me look like I go to the gym, which I do not. Um, I, I look I look strong in this. I, I really do. Not as strong as an IDF soldier, but um, that is one thing, how I look great in it. I, of course, I feel good in this like stretchy, awesome material. Uh, but more than that, my wife saw me in it and she's like, you look great. And um, I, I, she's awesome. I don't get many compliments with the clothing choices that I choose, maybe because I'm like a weird dresser, but um, it's rare that I've gotten something like that. And my wife approves. And if, if Gita Linger approves of Twillery, you need not go to any other clothing place. So go ahead and go to Twillery.com. You'll get $18 off. Yes, you listeners of Inspiration for the Nation or watchers, you're going to get off $18 when you spend $139 when you're a new customer with the code word INSPIRE. Little cheesy, but it works. So go ahead, check out Twillery. Whether you're looking for awesome long sleeve polos, even if you're not a long sleeve polo guy, but maybe you will be, or short sleeve polos, or button downs, or the most incredible pants in the world, or the most comfy suits ever, or scarves, or whatever it is that they have, because they have so much, Twillery.com, you will not regret it. Now back to this week's episode. Okay, so we we don't we don't have an unlimited amount of time here. So I definitely want to hear a story or two from each of you about your experience there. It could be a story that's uplifting us. Maybe maybe it's a sad story, story of someone who you lost. Whatever it is, uh, here's your platform to share with us a story. Okay. So a story I want to share is actually a very tough story. Um, it was the day before Hanukkah. And that morning, meaning that later that night we were supposed to light Hanukkah candles, one of the soldiers in our platoon was, was killed, was killed by a sniper. And that was really tough. It was also the first um, casualty that we had. And we were all, you know, broken. And how do you go from that to lighting Hanukkah candles four or five, six hours later? And we're gathered inside the, the house. We were a house that we were located in at the time. And if, obviously you light inside, you lighting outside will give away your position. And it hit me that, you know, this is a huge discussion about where to light Hanukkah candles in general. In the beginning, we would, the original mitzvah was to light outside. And at a certain point in history, it was moved to lighting Hanukkah candles inside on your table because it was too dangerous to light outside. And I'm like, I'm not the first one to go from tragedy to lighting Hanukkah candles. Like this is the Jewish story is that we, we get up after, uh, after tragedies and we keep going. And an idea came to me, I'm pretty sure I heard it before, uh, but I shared it with, with the fellow soldiers there, that the first night of Hanukkah, it's not clear what we're celebrating. This is uh, similar to a famous question by the Beit Yosef. Um, really the miracle 
you know, the candle was supposed to last one night, it lasted eight nights. So only the second night of Hanukkah was there even a miracle, right? The second night, the, the, the oil lasted longer than it was supposed to. So what are we even celebrating on the first night? And the idea that we all felt that night was the fact that after everything the Jews been through and the Beis Hamikdash was all destroyed, they went and, and got up and they kept searching for oil in the first place. You know, how many nations went through tragedies and just gave up and decided that's it, no more. And we're like, no, we're not giving up. And we searched for that oil and we found that oil and we kept on going. And to me, that's a greater miracle we're celebrating than oil lasting longer than it's supposed to. That we're still here after everything that happened, after years and years of people lighting Hanukkah candles, hiding inside their houses. Um, the difference is now we have another miracle called that God gave us called the IDF and the tanks and the Air Force and we could defend ourselves. We're lighting inside for a second to there are thousands and, and millions of Jews lighting outside proudly from their, uh, from, from their windows. So for me, that was the greatest miracle that we were able to continue after, after what we've been through. Really beautiful. Okay, Noam, turning to you and, and Shlomo, don't worry, we could get back to you with more stories, but let's give Noam a chance here. I have so many stories, but uh, I guess the, the, the biggest miracle that happened to us, um, we were supposed to go on a mission on uh, one Shabbat afternoon at about 3.30 p.m. Um, <clears throat> and the way that this mission was supposed to work is we we're about 80 meters from our location it was a, a building that overlooked a, you know an area that there were still terrorists in and we needed to you know keep a watch over while other units um, continued to, to move forward um, and it was about a three-story building and I was I'm a sniper so I was supposed to be on the top floor um, in a, a sniper post and the rest of the guys in my unit were supposed to be the floor below with a machine gun post and then like a room behind it more a safer room they were supposed to that was where everybody would sleep over the next 24 hours eat you know relax um, when they're not on on guard duty and so at about 3 28 p.m we were in formation on equipment ready to go we get on the radio ask our company commander uh, for permission to leave and he says uh one second I'll, let me get right back to you and a minute later, he gets on and he says, um, we're pushing it off by an hour. We're like, okay, this happens. Army, things get pushed off all the time. We go back upstairs, start relaxing again. Um, and about seven, eight minutes later, we hear three, four, five uh, explosions, which in Gaza in war is not surprising. You don't get, fl you don't get phased by explosions anymore after like the, the, the first week. And... Uh, um, so we weren't phased by that. Then all of a sudden you hear um, AK-47, PK fire, um, and you can tell the difference between an AK-47 and, uh, and our guns. Uh, and then we knew that this was enemy fire. Um, everybody gets back on equipment, um, uh, starts you know, reinforcing our, our, uh, our building. And we hear uh, over the radio that they suspect that something hit the building that we were supposed to go into, which again was only about 50, 80 meters from us. It would have taken us two minutes to get there. And um, so we push off this mission for another couple of hours until complete darkness falls. And under the cover of tank fire, we go into this building to check to see if it's still usable, if it was actually hit. Um, and we go into the building and we see um, that my, exactly where I would have been, was hit by an RPG. Um, another area in that same room was hit by an RPG. The room where um, the machine gun nest on the floor below was hit by an RPG and the room behind it was also hit by an RPG. We were supposed to be there at exactly that moment, setting up our, our, um, the building to be used for the next 24 hours. And we asked the Mempe, our, our company commander, why did, you, why did you push this off? He said, oh, my, my radio man said that he thinks it's a better time to go in an hour. So we pushed it off by an hour. <laughs> he was right. And uh, uh, Yad Hashem, God, we felt God's hand in that moment more than any other, at any other moment. Um, we, should have, we should have been there at that, exactly that time. I would have, like the RPG hit like 50 centimeters from where my head would have been. And there's no way you get out of that. Um, and we had a sudat todaya, you know, a, a meal at, at my house after we got out. Um, to say thank you to Akadosh Baruch Hu. and my entire unit sent Birkata Gomel, um, thanking Akadosh Baruch Hu for the for the miracles that 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 happened to us. Noam, could you tell me about? Um, I don't know if I'm saying the name properly. Or or okay, 
Orr is uh, a good friend of mine. We've, we've been serving together for almost 13 years now. Um, his name is Or Meir. He was uh, born on the first night of Hanukkah, so it's a really fitting name. Um, or and his wife, Osa, are completely secular. Um, and Osa was orphaned at a young age and was adopted by a family in Yerushalayim, last name Vaknin. And she had two adoptive twin brothers. Um, their names were Osher and Michael. Osher and Michael were the organizers of Nova. Um, and they were... Um, they were they were murdered on, on the 7th. And that was also her friend group. So she knew a lot of other uh, people who were hurt, uh, killed, or kidnapped on, on that terrible day. And or just like us, that late that night got a, what's called a Tzav Shmona, an emergency um, reserve notice that he needs to come down to base. And she she pushes him out the door, tells him, Or, you have a, you have a mission to do. Don't, we'll be okay. And... Or is with us for the next uh, three weeks that we're training down in the south. And we're about a week into Gaza at this point. And our company commander comes and asks, says, uh, ask for Or. Where is he? And which is, which is strange. Your company commander doesn't ask for a, a personal conversation with someone in the middle of a, a battlefield. And so we're all a little bit concerned. And he goes and he talks to Or. And he says, Or, there's a Hummer waiting for you to take you out. Um, your wife is in a coma in the ICU. Uh, she had a heart attack. She's 29 years old, spends, goes to the gym every day. They're, com- they're completely healthy. She had a broken heart from everything that happened to her and her family. And so this was also only two or three days after it happened. They couldn't get Orr out, so they didn't tell him. They didn't want they, to, him to deal with that um, while they couldn't get him out. And so he goes, he goes up. Uh, they live in the north. He goes up north and... Uh, he spends the next week with her. She gets out of a coma. She, she gets out of the, the ICU. She ends up getting home. She's really recovering. Uh, her aunt and uncle come to, to help them with their three kids. And she, again, she turns to him. She says, Or, you have a job to do. You have to go fight. You need, you need to go. And she sent him off again. And he spent the next month with us in, in Gaza fighting. Um, and... Him coming back was one of the most strengthening things I, for me because it just showed how special we are as a, as a people. That even the most secular, the person who you think is the most far from religion, um, understands what it means to be part of Am Yisrael and what it means to sacrifice for our people and to give everything for it. And it's not just the husbands who are going off to war, it's the wives too, um, in some ways more, more than us. Um, we're focused on one thing and they have, they're taking care of the home, working, um, uh, taking care of the kids, uh, worrying about us. Um, and they, they gave me so much, so much chizuk. That's really beautiful. What, what for each of you, what has been your greatest challenge while fighting? So I'll say the greatest challenge for me um, was knowing that my family back in Israel is, is worrying about us. Um, that, that is, you know, that eats me alive. You know, if I put myself in danger is one thing, but, you know, you have a whole family behind you. Um, and there's, there's a Rambam, there's a famous Rambam in uh, the end of Hilchot Malachim or the beginning, somewhere there, um, where he says going to war, you have to forget about your, um, your family. You have to forget about your family. I think he even says if you think about your family while you're at war, um, you're over on a lotase. Um, that's a really tough Rambam. I don't think, I've definitely been over that lotase for sure. <laughs> I'll hate, you know. Um, but I, I was thinking about it, it can't be. It can't be. I don't, know, I don't know what the Rambam really meant, but I thought of a creative reading that might uh, redeem us. And that is... You can't only think about your wife and children. If you only think about your own wife and your own children, then you'll, you'll be on the first bus out of Gaza. You have to think about all the wives um, and all the children and realize that we need people fighting. The Nei Yisrael needs, needs, you know, needs a shomrim. And, and maybe that's what he meant. If you only think about your own wife and, and, and children, then uh, you're over on the Lotase. Um, I completely identify. I think that was the, the most difficult thing for me as well. And I thought about that Rambam as well. 
I think we I had a little bit of a different reading, but I think it's the same in the end. Um, yeah, the, the worry for my family and like the thought of, you know, I'm be, like, I'm okay with, you know, everybody that was with us was okay with laying down our lives for, for Am Yisrael. Um, like, we're shelling with that. But it's the thought of leaving, of you know, leaving our families and them not having, you know, us, that we're not coming back to them. Um, the worry for them that they're, that they're not being taken care of, um, that was like the biggest worry. And it, that bothered me. It really it, it was the, the hardest struggle for me. And I thought a lot about the Rambam, that Rambam, until my wife, she sent me a letter uh, that we got in Gaza. Right? They, we got it sent in to us. And she was telling me how much all of our family, friends, and our community were taking care of her. Um, the yeshiva where I worked, Leva Torah, um, they sent her a meal every week. Um, our community took care of, my wife didn't cook for like two and a half months straight, um, for she, dinner at least. She started cooking after two and a half months? <laughs> I came home, so I helped now. <laughs> um, and just like her telling me all the, the love and support that she's been getting, and all of a sudden something clicked, as I say in, uh, in, in Israel, Nafala Asimon. Um, and I thought of the Rambam, and it says that you, and you need to rely on mikveh Yisrael. The mikveh is like the ritual immersion that you go in and you get purified. And why, why is it referring to Hashem as the mikveh of, of Yisrael? Um, so I think that mikveh Yisrael is not is referring to a Kaddish Baruch Hu's Shechina, God's presence in the world. And the Mekubal, the Zohar says that the Shechina is the neshama of Am Yisrael as a whole. And and it clicked all of a sudden that it's not that I'm not fearing for my wife and children. It's that I know that Am Yisrael is one, that we're taking care of one another, and that I have nothing to fear because Am Yisrael will take care of my family. And that I'm thinking of all the other wives as well, and all the other families, and that we're fighting for them too. And so you're not fearing for your particular family. You're, you're fighting for something bigger, something more whole. Um, and that gave me a lot, a lot of chizuk. I want to add another challenging thing on almost a, uh, a side note is, is the food. Um, tuna. <laughs> Only eating tuna. That's oh, yeah. really difficult. Um, I remember the first time I had another meal besides tuna. We found um, gas canister. We made it, worked out the whole kitchen. Uh, we made a cholent. Hmm. We made a cholent in Gaza. Um, and it was, it was amazing. Um, and from then on, we started like really working on on eating well. And I, I have to say, I don't think I've eaten tuna in like in like three or four weeks. <laughs> so that challenge has been uh, surpassed. But um, but that's 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 very difficult for me. Um, Am Yisrael really sent us a lot of food in Gaza. There were there were nights where we got like hamburgers still hot. Um, we were the most northern like community um, in Gaza. It's called Beit Hanun. So it was a little bit lo logistically easier to get us food. And uh, the first time we got like real home cooked food, we got uh, there were just simple deli sandwiches. And I remember that was like the most delicious deli sandwich I've ever eaten because uh, yeah, tuna, whew, you get sick of it pretty quickly. Yeah. We will be right back to this week's episode. But first, I need to tell you about a book. That will enhance your life. Growth Through Darkness by the wonderful Rabbi Mordechai Zev Trank, which actually overlapped with him in Rabbi Sen's Yeshiva, is a fantastic read. It is published by Adir Press and distributed by Feldheim. The book discusses the fact that Hashem loves us even more than we love ourselves. Yet, everyone faces challenges, right? And experiences that are difficult. And we're told that not only that our good fortune, but also our suffering is an expression of Hashem's love. How does that even work? So this book explores that. It's exploring the life-changing wisdom of our sages. Growth through darkness reveals Hashem's hidden kindness behind the difficulties we experience and how we as Yidin can use these tests to bring forth our hidden potential. And quoting excessively from the greatest names of our illustrious history, Rabbi Trank demonstrates how to view that very obstacle in our life and the impediments that we face as means of growth. And not only that, 
how we could improve our life through it. And what I personally love about this book is the extensive Lashana Kodesh sources that you could see and like look up and delve even deeper in the book, which a lot of books these days don't have, and they do. And with the current war in Israel, our brothers and sisters are literally on the front lines, who I'm talking to this week. And the massive uptick in anti-Semitism everywhere throughout the world is, is really difficult. And we're dealing with unprecedented challenges. So our world seems very confusing. Why would Hashem, who loves us, allow these things to happen? It's a pretty good question. And on a communal level or a personal level, enter Growth Through Darkness, where Rabbi Trank sheds light on how these challenges that we're experiencing now becomes catalysts for tremendous personal growth. Again, it's not like gonna be the answer, but it gives us layers. And with topics like punishments are with precision or Yusurim, which is a challenges, brings one to tefillah or Yusurim, again, challenges, uh, lead to a perfect world. And there's a lot more in there. So this book is available in your local farm store on Amazon and Feldon.com. And of course, the link in the show notes. So go out and buy or order yours now. And while you're waiting, for our Inspiration for the Nation listeners, you will be able, when you're waiting for the book to arrive, you will be able to get a sample, yes, that is true, a sample of the book that is available and it deals with the topic of growing from Yisurim, which again, it means challenges. So go ahead and click on the link in the show notes and you will get a little sneak peek and Leading up to the my favorite moment of this episode, you'll hear it. But first, are you familiar with the high costs of local hiring where hourly rates can soar between $20 to $50? And let's not forget the challenge of finding a skilled employee who's immediately available. But what if there's a more cost-effective solution? Introducing Hiring for Less. Yes, your gateway to hiring dedicated full-time remote employees from overseas for just $7 an hour, totaling only $280 a week. Imagine having an employee who works a nine to five schedule aligned with your time zone, equipped with excellent English proficiency and the specific job experience you need. Hiring for Less isn't just about affordable hiring. They've successfully connected employers with remote experts in various fields, including, we're gonna go through a list now, customer service, uh, real estate, bookkeeping, data entry, cold calling, photo and video editing, architectural design, e-com assistance, personal secretarial work, and other specialized roles. But Hiring for Less offers more than just recruitment. They guide you through training and communication, best practices, ensuring your overseas employees seamlessly integrate into your team. Plus, there are no binding contracts. Love that. Hidden fees, upfront costs, or recruitment charges. Simply outline your requirements and Hiring for Less will match you with a skilled overseas professional for an unbeatable rate of $7 per hour. Plus, if you mention Living Lechaim, you'll get a bonus free week employees for 50% off. Yes, Call, text, WhatsApp, 845-682-0990 or contact them at hiringforless.com. Of course, like always, we will have the links in the show notes below. Go ahead, check them out. Love them. No contracts that will lock you in and mess you over. They're good people and they'll give you good people to work for you so you could make more cash money. Now back to this week's episode. How do you approach like being a from Jew while you're there? Like, is there ever opportunity to, I mean, obviously it's, it's life and death in many situations, many times where obviously someone's putter from tefillin and davening. Um, are you guys able to wear tefillin? Are you able to daven? How does that work? Um, so it totally depends on the situation on the day. For me personally, there are days where you have no time to, to learn. Um, we always had time for, for tefillin. Um, but there have been days when, you know, there's nothing to blow up for a couple hours. And then, uh, so we have time to learn. And there are about four or five rabbis in my unit and another couple that are uh, on, on their way to becoming rabbis. And it is a different experience than the regular, regular Beit Midrash. <laughs> um, so many questions come up. You know, you find olive oil, not kosher olive oil. Are you allowed to use it? Is it uh, orla? I have no idea how to translate that in, uh, into English. Um, Suffolk orla. You know, all these different, uh, different questions. That's the, we had a really crazy situation. We got in a lot of trouble for this. But 
one Shabbos, a Sefer Torah showed up in the room next door, in the house next door where we were staying, and we wanted to go there on Shabbat to hear Torah reading. And someone raised the point, maybe who says you're allowed to carry? You can't go outside without carrying your equipment. So obviously for a mission, you wear all your equipment, but who says you could go outside, carry all your equipment where there's no Erev in order to go hear Sefer Torah? Maybe it's better to stay in your house and not hear Sefer Torah. Whole big debate back and forth. Um, in the end, I said, why don't we just build an Erev? Let's go outside and, you know, attach some strings to some things. We'll get an Erev. Um, and we did it. And as we were finishing, the Samchat, the, <laughs> one of the top commanders of the battalion, shows up. And he's like, what are you guys doing? And we're like, we're building an Erev. And he, he went crazy. He's like, you're building an Erev in Gaza. Don't you know where you are? <laughs> Uh, he was a religious guy. And we're like, no, it's not for the need for the war. It's for something else. Um, yeah, he told us he was going to cut it down. He didn't cut it down. And we had our Arab and we went to hear uh, Torah reading. Um, I actually, I sent a letter to, to my brother. I have a brother who's learning in Yerushalayim. And there's a famous, there are psukim in Yoshua, and a famous Gemara where Yoshua started his war to conquer Israel. And a malach, an angel, shows up with a sword to kill him. And he asks the malach, uh, what are you doing? Why are you killing me? And he asks, Halon, are you on our side? Or are you against us? And the malach very cryptically answers, Atabati, uh, I've come now. So the Gemara says that Yeshua missed out on two mitzvot. He didn't bring a sacrifice, the daily sacrifice that day. And he didn't learn Torah that night. And... He asked the Malach, which Avera, which uh, transgression, mm -hmm. is it because I didn't bring the carbon or is it because I didn't learn Torah? And the Malach says back, Atabati, I came now for your sin of not learning Torah now. And I asked my brother, I said, this doesn't make any sense. They're in the middle of a war. Even though the, maybe they finish fighting at night, they need a rest for tomorrow. Of course they are putter from, from learning Torah. They don't have to learn Torah. So how could it be that they were getting punished, they were going to be killed because they didn't learn Torah in war? And he sent me an answer. It was incredible. He quoted the pun of Vichurov. I think someone could check me out on that. That said, there's a deeper level to this story. Yoshua was asking, Halanu ata olitzarenu. What's lanu? Why does lanu mean learning Torah? Lanu is Torah tziva lanu. God commanded us to learn Torah. Torah tziva lanu Moshe. Um, and ata, the, the Malach's answer was, Ata bati, I came now. I came now, Atta is reference to the Pasuk, Atta kitvu lachem et ashira hazos. Right? Or hazot. Um, now, uh, that's a Pasuk in the Torah about writing, writing down the Sefer Torah, writing down the Torah as a song. So he didn't answer the same as Yeshua's question. Yeshua said, I'm being punished for not learning Torah with Torah Tzivalanu Moshe. And the Malach answered, Atta kitvu lachem et ashira hazos. And the answer was, of course, your potter from Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe. We don't have to go and bring a Sefer Torah into Gaza and do Kriya Satorah. Of course we're potter, right? But the, it's, we need it. It's a song. It's our, it's our life. It gives us the spirit to fight. It's why, it's why we fight. It gives us so much strength. We can't go on without learning Torah. So even though we're not commanded, we try as much as we can to, uh, to learn the Torah. So that was what the letter I got back from my brother. And I said it over when we were using the Torah. I said to our fellow command, you know, soldiers, we're crazy. We're learning, reading from the Sefer Torah in Gaza. But that's, uh, Jews are, are crazy for the Torah. Yeah. We do crazy things for, uh, for the sake of Torah. So uh, that's just one story of, of many of uh, religious experiences in, uh, in Gaza. Um, so I have a little bit of like a different experience because I'm one of the only religious guys in my, in my platoon. Um, my unit refers to me as the unit rabbi. So we only had one. They had five. Um, so Trust I would me, often... It's easier be, to only have one. <laughs> <laughs> then you don't have machloket. Yeah. Right? Um, and even the most secular guy, if I was on like Shmira with him, on guard duty with him, would be asking me for Divrei Torah, um, Divrei Chizuk. There was one night where we got back from 20 hours off in a base in Ashkelon um, after spending two weeks in Gaza. And then we went back in on Shabbos. And the commander of my unit, who's just one of the guys from our unit who got promoted to be the commander, um, is engaged and he, and we were on Shmira together. And he 
he looked down. He looked really down after getting back. Like I felt, I felt like I had new, new strength after seeing my wife and kids for, we only got to see them for like an hour and a half, but I felt renewed strength. And it was strange to me that he, that he looked so down. So I asked him, I said, Shlomo, why, why are you so down? He said that his wife, that him and his fiance are supposed to get married on January 3rd. They got, they just got married last Wednesday, uh, Baruch Hashem. And they were about to start their Hassan and Kala classes to learn, you know, Hilchot Tarad Mishpacha, the laws of family purity, which, by the way, was the first thing that we learned together in uh, in Kolel. Which you guys, I just um, want to say, I don't know if it was said, you guys were Chavrusas for five years? We yeah. were Chavrusas for chai, five years in, in Kolel. Yeah, Amazing. Um, Amazing. Hashem, we spent, I think, those five years more time together than we did with our wives. Uh, <laughs> it was the hardest part about Kolel. It's not being with our wives. Um, and so he was... Shlomo was very upset that they weren't going to be able to prepare for their wedding properly. And like he was, he was just, they, they, wouldn't, they didn't know that they would even be able to learn before their wedding. And I told him, I said, Shlomo, it's, uh, it's Yad Hashem that we're together. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I could teach you. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a chassan teacher. And so for the next three weeks, uh, whenever we were on Shmirah together and we had uh, the ability to focus on, on, on this, I gave him his uh, chassan classes. And... Uh, that also, so really machazik, you know, living Torah while, while in Gaza. And as Shlomo said also, that, that there's a lot of novel um, questions, halakha questions that come up, and you really experience the Torah as a Torah Tchaim, as a living Torah that's adapting to your situation um, that has an answer for every situation. Um, and to me, that, that was just a a very beautiful experience of, of really feeling the Torah as a, as a living Torah. No, um, I saw a picture of you, correct me if I'm wrong, wearing tefillin as you're with the sniper gun. Does that make sense? Is there a story behind yes. that? Yes. Yeah. So um, it's a little bit of a short, st- like a shorter story. Um, basically, when I set up a sniper post, I, I can't be at it for 24 hours. So g- other guys take over for me when I need a rest. Um, to like use binoculars and look and search out and see if there are any targets. Um, so uh, I was in the middle of davening. I had my tefillin on, and one of the guys who was who was uh, at the post um, saw movement from a building, and uh, so he called me over. I didn't have time to take off my tefillin, and so I go, I get into the into position, put the 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 gun in my you know shoulder, put start searching for for this target, and I was searching for it with my tefillin on for about about an hour. Didn't, didn't see any movement, uh, ended up, you know, being able to hand it back to him so I could finish davening. Um, but before I, before I left, I thought it was, uh, you know, uh, a good picture to take. Uh, so one of the guys in the, in the unit took a picture for me of, uh, in the, you know, while doing, doing what we do uh, with my tefillin on. Really amazing. Okay, there's, there's so many more questions that I have for you guys, but we definitely need to wrap up soon. What do you say, I meant, I'm definitely seeing, I'm not at the forefront of the real battle that you guys are on, but we're definitely, you know, seeing so many haters online. I don't even know if they understand what's going on with the war or they're just like, oh, Jews, let's hate on them. What what would you, for, based on like what you're seeing in Gaza, what would you say to someone who's like an average American who's like by college campus and they're like, oh, yeah, uh, Poor Palestinians and the Jews are the evil ones here. What, what would you say to them? We, we had uh, received a mission to uh, re- like our, our dude, so our, our battalion um, had received a mission to raid a, a UN school, uh, UNRWA school um, that was being used as a Hamas command uh, center. And... Um, Unfortunately, during that mission, uh, one of the members of our Pluga, Raz Abu Lafia, Hashem Yikom Demo, was, uh, was killed. Um, and we raided this school. I, was on, I wasn't part of the mission, that, that, the part of the mission that went into the school. But our unit found um, in this, this school, right, where little kids come and learn every single day, a command center for Hamas, where um, they planned where their, their attacks from, from where they um, um, directed rocket fire into Israel from. Um, and they found evidence in, that, in this school that, the, that at the beginning, um, many of the hostages were being held prisoner there. 
the use, the cynical use of civilian uh, infrastructure for the most horrible things you could imagine um, is something you just can't ignore. And if you ignore it, then you're just choosing to be blind to the to, to the horrors of, of the world that we live in. Um, to, uh, for me, to, to see a school being used for 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 terrorism, for murder and massacring civilians is I still almost can't believe it myself. Um, you just need to open your eyes to reality. I would also add, you know, the way you phrase the question, uh, what about the the poor Palestinians? It's of course, yeah, there are a lot of poor Palestinians. The situation stinks. Um, there are terrible things happening. Um, the, we have to look at the bigger picture and realize, you know, this is where <laughs> this is helping the Palestinians. You know, we have to destroy Hamas. Um, at the end of the day, they are they're victims just as much as you know the Palestinians are victims just as much. In, in, in a certain sense, just as much as as uh, as we are, and we need to rid, rid the world of evil. And sometimes there are heavy costs of ridding the world of evil. Uh, but just from the point of view, from the front lines, we're there, and we don't really have a big picture of what's going on. So to think that someone's able to know everything that's going on from an armchair behind the Twitter <laughs> is is just silly. Uh, the situation is is complicated. It's very complex, and. We, you need to see the big picture, which is something that's very hard to do. Um, also, just uh, I guess uh, something that I've been thinking about a lot is that a lot of times when people criticize um, the inhumanity of war, which there's an aspect of humanity which is which is of um, of war, which is horrible, and it's a terrible place to be. It's a really dark place. But the things that that you see from there, you you can't see from here. Um, the type of you know cynical use of civilian infrastructure is just something that you can't really wrap your head around until you see a uh, terror tunnel coming out from a playground of a kindergarten. Uh, you just don't understand what evil is in this world until you see people using children as human shields like that. Um, and so when you don't experience something, you've never experienced something yourself, we all need to understand that like our our lens through which we view the world is lacking because we don't have the experience um, to understand it. So when we're sitting behind the computer, we need to have a little bit of modesty and say like, I don't understand what warfare is. I've never had to face terrorism. Very well said. And what I would also say to the people on college campuses is, is be strong. You know, you guys are also fighting a huge battle. I can't imagine what's that, what, what that's like uh, without experiencing it. Um, so thank you for, for fighting on that front. Yeah. Very well said. Um, Before I get to my last question, I, I want to ask each of you that, you know, obviously it, this entire war is complex and the emotions I, I imagine are also very complex. Like so one moment could be lighthearted, even though like, you know, you're with, I guess at this point, all your friends and you're, you're on the mission of your life. Um, and then it could get very serious very quickly. What's the, what's the, when you're saying goodbye to your wife and your family process, like each time that you like, you come back and you have to go back in there, what's that experience like? Ooh, it's always hard. It's yeah. always really, really hard. Um, it, it, a lot depends on, you know, on your wife. Uh, if your wife is able to say goodbye with, I know, Obviously, it tears in her eyes, but with a smile and encouraging, it makes things so much easier. And there are some guys who uh, I know that when they came back, it was much more difficult for their wives to do that. And it was, and they came back with much more emotional baggage. I, Baruch Hashem, my wife has been so incredibly strong and was always able to send me off with encouraging words, no matter how hard it was. Um, it was more difficult with my kids. They didn't really understand what was going on. Uh, my youngest son, Yaakov, um, at first, we had gotten out for, for about 24 hours. We were supposed to go back, you know, on Friday morning. Um, and at that point, he was not, he was not ready to say goodbye to me. Anytime I went near the door, he would break down hysterically crying. No, Abba, don't go. I'm getting my shoes. I come with you. I, don't go. And like, I wasn't even leaving. I was just went near the door and it was tearing my heart out. 
Um, and then we got uh, the news that we could stay out for Shabbat. And by the time I had to leave Motzei Shabbos, um, he was he was able to say goodbye with me, like with a hug, without crying. And that made uh, such a world of difference to me, to, to not have to say goodbye in tears. Um, Yeah, I got an emotional thinking about it. It's a, one of the, I think that for me, that was the hardest part of, of this experience. Um, saying goodbye, not knowing if, you know, you'd come back. You're able to say that, you know, we just, we just pretend that uh, everything's going to be fine, you know. Um, but yeah, saying goodbye is not, is not easy. Um, I think it's still worth it to go home. Some people are like, it's easier just to stay in the army. I think those people are crazy. Uh, if they're giving you a chance to go home, you go home. But yeah, saying goodbye is, is not something that's, uh, that's easy ever, but especially go, going off to war. This whole war has been balancing contradictory emotions, you know, going from the story I told about Hanukkah, you know, going from light to darkness, going from being with the family to not being with family, going to joking around with friends to going on a mission. Uh, but life's like that, you know, living with uh, contradictions and focusing on what's at hand and being able to compartmentalize different different emotions. And yeah, we're going to need therapy afterwards. <laughs> I think without war, everyone needs therapies, but uh, I especially yes. now I, I can understand that. Okay, so I want to finish off with give you guys the floor. Um, I know there's probably 17 other things on your list of things that we should and could discuss. But if you want to finish off with maybe a story, maybe a moment that gives you inspiration, maybe, you know, Noam, I, I know you were talking about, you gave a speech that I, I, I watched, it was amazing, like talking about like what David Amalek was, was going through, whatever it is, each of you, I want to open the floor to say parting words to the audience. Okay, so maybe I'll take this one. Um, I actually got a request from, uh, from a teacher in Montreal to send a video telling her students how much her tefillot make a difference and how much their learning for us and our merit is making a difference and to give them words of encouragement. And I was a little torn about how to do that because um, the effect of the tefillot, it's not up to me. That's a question for God. You know, how am I supposed to come and tell them your tefillot are going to be answered? It's, uh, it's God's decision, uh, not mine. I like to believe that, he, that they're helping and they're making a strong difference. But how could I come with confidence and be like, you know, your tefillah are going to be answered. And then I thought of a story that happened in the army that I think I, I do have an answer for them. And it was in the first three weeks while we were still training. And we got a delivery of delicious hamburgers. And I'm not talking about, you know, regular. These are the fancy ones with the toothpick down the middle. <laughs> You know, top quality, each one handcrafted. When they arrived, we were out on a training exercise off base. And we came back really late at night. No one saw them. We all went straight to sleep. And we woke up in the morning to these piles of the most amazingly spoiled hamburgers. Aww. And they were thrown out. And like, it was tough. But then what we realized was seeing that those boxes of hamburgers was like getting a huge long distance hug from whoever sent them. And that feeling of, hey, we're behind you, we support you, was much better than any hamburger could actually taste. So what's happening in Shemayim with the tefillot, I'll leave that for God to answer. But I want everyone to know, whoever's davening for us, doing things for us, we know that you're davening for us. And down here, it's definitely 100% making a difference. It's what gives us strength to keep fighting. So keep davening, keep sending whatever support you can, and thank you. Um so much so much to say um a small point on, on what you said i guess uh feed off of that of cook writes that uh, the um the way in which tefillot like the reason why a kaddish baruch who answers our tefillot for others is when we identify with them when we have achdut with them so when the more you feel that achdut towards the person that you're davening for or that you feel it from the person that you're receiving it from the more he says that you know our tefillot are answered so uh, I felt that, you know, with uh, all the achdut uh, coming in, that feeling of, you know, not being just, you know, uh, an individual or being part of Am Yisrael um, and what that really means. Um, and just the event identifying with the, the klal, but um, also going when, when in 
Gaza, you're not really able to learn, right? You may be able to have like Torah discussions with, with other people um, if you have the presence of mind. But um, for the most part, like what I would do in terms of learning, I had a Mesila Yisharim on me and I had a Tehillim. So I said, I said a lot of Tehillim and I really, you know, David Amelech was the, the warrior king, the, the warrior poet. Um, and I felt a lot of, uh, identified a lot with, with David Amelech. And um, David Amelech writes, Kam ki elech mavet lo irara. Even when I, when I walk in the shadow of the valley of death, I won't fear any evil. Ki atai madi, for, for you are with me. And going into Gaza, you feel like, like you're in the gates of mavet, that you're in the valley of the shadow of death. And um, it couldn't be a darker place than that. There's nothing more fitting to that line. And I really identified with David Amelech in him saying that. And, but later in the parak, he says something that, I, that it took me a while to, to figure out and understand. He says, <laughs> that only good and, and kindness have run after me my, uh, all the days of my life. Like David Melech, you're, you're saying that as you go into the shadow of the Valley of Death, as you go into the gates of Mavit, you're chased by Shaul HaMelech and by your son Avshalom. How can you say I've only been, you know, chased by good and kindness all the days of my life? And I, I really struggled with that, you know, on the one hand, identifying with David Melech, and on the other hand, it's like, David Melech, I don't get you. Um, and... I, through all the experiences of really feeling a Kaddish Baruch Hu, like with us there in Gaza, I, I realized that that David Melech isn't coming to say that um, there's no such thing as dark times. God's always there, always be happy. He's he's saying that even in those dark times, God is there, hidden, and everything is eventually good for the ultimate good, and you just have to train yourself to see Him in the darkness, um, that he's matzitz min acharachim, as it says in the Shir Hashirim, that he's peering through the cracks, that, it, that there, you know, there's a famous uh, song, tefillah, that afilu be'astara she'betocha astara be'vaday gam sham nimtza Hashem barach, that even the, 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 the God hiding within his hiding place, is cert- even there Hashem is found. Even in the darkest of places he is found. And I felt it's uh, not Gam Sham, I think it's Dafka Sham. That's where you can find God the most. Um, and we just have to train ourselves how to, how to see him in the darkness. Okay, I just gotta ask, is there any thank you shout outs that either of you wanna give to whoever you wanna give it to? Sure, I'll start out. First of all, to my wife, Eliza, she's been amazing. To my parents who've been so, so supportive and helping. Um, a big shout out to Beef Up Our Boys. They're a organization that uh, sends beef jerky to soldiers. A so you don't have to eat tuna. Out, so you don't have to eat tuna. Thank you. Uh, big shout out to Young Israel of Riverdale. I had cousins there that sent us a lot of support. Very to very my big. family in Passaic. Um, thank you. You've been uh, incredible. And to everyone else sending support to whoever gets it. You know, and all those unnamed packages we get as well. Yeah, um, gotta, I agree with all of that. Uh, thank you to my wife, Elisheva, for being the most supportive um, of everything that we've been doing. Um, to both of our parents for all of the you know, support and equipment that they helped get for us. My wife's uncle also sponsored some equipment that we needed in, in Gaza. Uncle Sam, thank you. Um, and um, to really all of the, our communities. I remember receiving a, uh, a pack of like protein granola from the high school that I went to, SAR High School, mm-hmm. like in the middle of Gaza. I'm like, what is this doing here? Like <laughs> at a logo and just seeing all of Amisrael pour their love into us has just been uh, so incredible. So just uh, thank you to all of Amisrael and thank you. Thank you for interviewing us. Thank you for being on here. I wish both of you uh, only had slacha and that you need not go back into Gaza. I know Noam, I know Sh- uh, Shlomo, you're supposed to go back uh, tomorrow. Um, I hope the war ends ASAP. Um, and then Noam, I know, you know, in a few weeks or whenever it is. <laughs> I don't know about that. But no, listen, I hope I hope we get the hostages back and I hope uh, you take care of uh, all our enemies very soon and that... Uh, We'll, uh, I'll, I'll be meeting you by the third base of Mikdash very soon. Thank you so much for a, another episode of Inspiration for the Nation that you've watched or listened to. 
I can't even imagine how many of you actually went on and left a comment last episode. So Hadas saw it, I see it, and it means the world to us. So go ahead and leave a comment on our YouTube video if you got this far, or Spotify, because you can leave comments there. And uh, say the words Am Yisrael Chai, or whatever message or idea that you want to say about uh, what's been going on. If you haven't yet checked out Bitbean, go to their website, you click the link in the show notes and see how they will take your company to the next level, no matter if you're a massive company or a teeny little tiny company that wants to become a massive company. And also go ahead and use the code word INSPIRE on Twilio.com when you spend over $139. And if you are trying to build up your company with over the seas, awesome people that could work for you, and they speak great English and they do a great job and there is no lock-in where you're going to get sucked in and then having to pay for them for seven years even though you hate them go ahead and ch check out Hiring for Less they are an awesome company and lastly we're going through a challenging time life is filled with challenges go to your local bookstore or feltime.com or the link in the show notes and get Grow Through Darkness Awesome Buck by Rabbi Trank now I've been seeing a pattern in people, and there's a big difference, not automatically, but an overall difference between the Jewish people in America and the Jewish people in Israel. And I think there's a bigger concern and more worry from people in America and people in Israel who are going through such hardships that they are the, the people that aren't down, they're stronger and to me, I, I think they a lot of them have a lot more to be worried and sad about, but they're the ones giving chizek. I mean, just these two. I, I imagine that this conversation would have been just like more intense, more serious, and like they're so positive and so fun, and um, they they don't have an easy job. We all know that. We know what's actually going on and and how they're defending and the people of 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 Israel and the Jewish people and trying to get back our hostages, but. Still, they're moving with a certain idea and belief that Hashem is the one ultimately in control. And um, I think it's a lesson for me. And I think a lesson for a lot of us in America that there's so much to be worried about. But when you really think about it with Hashem in control, doesn't matter what stupid people say on X, doesn't matter the threats and the things that we get. We know that we have a father in heaven, in Shemayim, father here on earth. And Hashem is here to protect us. He loves us. And we got to just keep on doing what it means to emulate him in the best way possible. So keep on ahead and keep on being proud to be a Jew. And remember, there's inspiration. Oh, wait, actually, hold on. Also want to thank, big shout out to uh, Yeshivat Leva Torah, where we actually filmed this, where Noam and Shlomo were. And I, I thought it was remarkable that they each have limited time in between them going in and out of Gaza. And they told me the best place to do it is in Yeshiva because that's where they're going to be. They're going to be either with their family or learning. And it's like, I'm in America and, you know, I, I'm part of Kenya Masakta. I'm very proud of it. And then I dive in and there's times I miss. And it's like, how could I miss if these guys are like literally giving their entire life to go and fight for us? And then whenever they have time, they go and learn Torah. It's really remarkable. So what I was saying was there's inspiration everywhere. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.